So it is my privilege to introduce our guest speakers. And as you know, just, uh, uh, former Congressman Joseph Diavati and Shirley Cloyes Diavati, a distinguished married couple, each of whom independently and both together have a biological background of incredible intelligence, influence, involvements, perspectives, achievements, and activities, which you, you will hear about this morning. We will hear about. It's our pleasure to have you both. Thank you. Thank you. And here this morning, we warmly welcome you. Shirley Cloyes Diaguardi was raised in uh, Westfield, New Jersey, and has a phenomenal scholastic background. She graduated with a degree in sociology from Oberlin College and a Master of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary in New York City. She studied Indonesian language at the University of California at Berkeley and then taught for two years at Satya Wakana University in Central Java, where she directed a program on interethnic relations and development. She has written and lectured widely about the Balkan conflict and is the Balkan Affairs Advisor to the Albanian American Civic League, a position she has held since 1995. She's been enormously involved with members of Congress to bring lasting peace and stability to the Balkans. She created a videotape project on the role that Albanians played in rescuing every Jew who lived in Albania or sought asylum there during the Nazi Holocaust. She's an author and has been involved in publishing. What I just described about each of our speakers does not even come close to the many, many activities in which they have been involved and still are involved individually and as a couple. They are remarkable. Their bio is sensation. Every uh, generation has to fight fascism and ultranationalism, or we'll come back. If we understand anything about the Holocaust, um, we should understand that. And so I decided to embark on this book publishing project that uh, Joe mentioned to try to bring perspective of the anti-war, anti its opposition from inside the former Yugoslavia to the American public. Now, why would I have made that decision? And I can tell you that, and this is very important, I grew up in a relatively privileged Presbyterian family in Westfield, New Jersey, and I was about uh, 10 years old when the Eichmann trials began. And I certainly wasn't reading the New York Times then, but I saw the pictures of the ovens in Auschwitz on the, on the cover of the, of the Times. And, sorry. and I came to my parents and I asked, you know, I asked for an explanation. And it was the beginning of my awakening and my commitment to um, genocide prevention. That was uh, the way I began my life. Now, fast forward today, we're in a really important juncture in history. We've got maybe maximum 10 years. When most of the survivors of the Shoah and um, rescuers are going to have passed on. And therefore, it's extremely important, in my opinion, for us to fill in as many gaps in the Holocaust history as we possibly can while they are still alive. And we also have to understand, I think, um, this is one of my favorite books, as um, Shoshana Feldman and Dr. Dory Lau have in you know, their book, Testimony. Uh, they said, the history of the Holocaust is essentially not over. It's a history whose repercussions are not simply omnipresent, but whose consequences are still actively evolving. And they cite Eastern Europe as one of the examples. Now, as many of you know, as soon as Eastern European countries emerged from the Holocaust and the horrors of it, they were immediately put under the yoke of communism, and the communists suppressed all discussion, knowledge of the Holocaust for years, and they were talking about 50, 50 years. So, um, recovering 
this lost history and bearing witness to it, um, in my opinion, is absolutely essential if we really care about never again and, and ensuring that it, is, it happens not, never more. Now, um, Joe gave you some description of the Albanian world. I'm going to try to make this, I think, consolidated, make it a little easier. There are 15, the number of Jews and the number of Albanians in the world are almost the same. 15 million, 16 million, am I correct about that? Um, Albanians are the oldest um, ethnic group in the Balkans. They're the indigenous uh, population. They were the Illyrians. And they came thousands of years ago. Um, they are different from their Slavic neighbors. They use the Roman alphabet. Um, originally, uh, they were all Christians and some Jews, as Joe said, for the reasons he described what happened. Um, then, and, and this is also very similar to Jewish history, they had to fight off waves and waves and waves of oppression and occupation. So by the 14th century, um, we have what, what becomes 350 years of Ottoman occupation. And that's the point where, you know, you, you may hear in your travels or on television that, oh, Albanians, aren't they Muslims? Aren't they all? Aren't they all? Um, and the thing that happened, in fact, was that it was an imposed Islam that was never accepted. Albanians are only those who are Muslim and the, the, they are the majority. Albanians are Muslims, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Christians and Jews. Um, they are just nominally um, Muslim. And so that oppression lasted for many, many years, for 400 to be exact. And then no sooner did they emerge from that, there were the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913, in which the Ottoman Empire fell. Then we have World War I. And um, coming out of World War I, this is why Albanians revere Americans so much. Woodrow Wilson managed to keep the state of Albania intact. This was once all of Albania, and all the other Albanian lands were carved up. That's why you may have some confusion about Kosovo, Albania. Well, there's Macedonia, Montenegro, Kresheva, Chamria in Greece, Kosovo, and the state of Albania. So suddenly, at the end of World War I, we have Albania, and now outside of it, all the other Albanian lands under uh, Slavic domination. Now, and this is a really important part of the story of why Albanians uh, came, to, came to save Jews, because how did they survive this onslaught and still maintain who they were? Um, and they did it because they had this whole history of religious tolerance, resistance, and hope in response to all these successive waves of domination from the Romans to the Ottomans and even later to the Nazis and the Communists because of something called Kanun and its underlying code called Besa. And the Kanun is basically a system of customary laws for how you deal with every aspect of your life. And Besa which lies at the heart, has different meanings. It ranges from faith, trust, truth, or word of honor, sacred promise and obligation to keep one's word, to provide hospitality and protection, and above all, it involves uncompromising protection of the guest. In any Albanian house, you'll see the, that uh, the guest is more important than even any member of the family. And the canoon requires, and Bessa requires, that if um, you have a guest in your house, um, you even have to go to the point of forfeiting your own life in order to save um, the life of anyone seeking ref refuge. So it was Besa, not religion, that underlay the Albanian uh, saving role during World War II. Um, it, it begins, by the way, just so you know, initially um, it was Mussolini in 1939. It was the Italians that came into Albanian lands. Uh, they invaded, they occupied, in 43 they were followed by the Nazis. And they remained, of course, until the end of the war. Now, when European Jewry began fleeing um, uh, Western Europe, um, at that time there were 200 Jews living already living in Albania. And um, 
there were actually many more archaeological evidence, you know, documents the presence of Jews, as Joe said, from the epic of the Roman rule. But at various points, they move on to other lands. You have people, you know, there was a lot of migration going on in those days for economic reasons largely. It wasn't because they had to flee Albania. Um, they might have gone into Venice, they were traders, um, they were spread um, throughout out, out the um, region. Um, at the end of the war, and this is the only um, country that can claim this, there were more than 2,000 Jews living in Albania, so more than um, existed before, the only nation that can claim they rescued every Jew who made it to Albanian lands. Now, on the one hand, some scholars would argue that the fact that Albanians were completely closed off for so long, they were, they were separated from um, the, the, the universe of anti-Semitism. They really didn't have any exposure to institutionalized anti-Semitism. So this was a crucial factor, of course. And in fact, I, I love this. One of the witnesses to this reality happens to be a Jew, an American Jew, and we're very fortunate in this, who was ambassador to Albania in the 1930s. And his name was um, Herman Bernstein, and he, um, he was actually just there from 30 to 33. And he wrote in his letters to Washington, quote, there is no trace of any discrimination against Jews in Albania, because Albania happens to be one of the rare lands in Europe today where religious prejudice and hate do not exist, even though Albanians themselves are divided into in the three phase. Um, nevertheless, the principal reason for Albanian saving Jews was the history of the Kanun and of Vesa. And so um, another interesting component of this is that the Western concept of foreigner, we're all can, we all understand the concept of foreigner, it doesn't even exist in the Kanun, only the concept of the guest. Hence, and this was said often, there were no Jewish foreigners in Albania during World War II, only Jewish guests who had to be sheltered and protected even at the risk of Albanian lives. So the Albanian rescue of Jews was, as I said before, not a religious act, it was an Albanian act. And this is important too, it involved every part of the population from the political elite to the rural pe uh, peasantry. This is very rare, and I'll never forget in November of 2007, when Joe and I went to Yad Vashem and, uh, for the first time. And we were taken, we were very fortunate, we were taken on a private uh, tour through the museum. And I don't know, I'm sure many people in this room have been there. Towards the end, there are these tower photographs of people who, of, of the executioners, of the, the, the main architects of the final solution, but not all the ones that we would typically think about. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, you know Goebbels, for example. Um, it was, um, there were people I had never even heard of, and there had been a great debate about whether to put their photographs there. It's as if they were being, in some ways, reified, you know, in history, and there was a little biography attached to each. What was the reason they decided to do it? And I, I, this is so powerful. Almost all of them were PhDs. Almost all of them were products of the European Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them were products of the leading German universities. They had become totally unhinged from any ethical base. And yet Albanians, most of whom had no education who were involved in the rescue, had held on to their humanity and had extended it. And that is, you know, to me, um, it, it, it tells us a lot, I think, about what we have to do even today. And um, there is one story that I think is remarkable, um, a good example, and it will show just how, you know, the extent to which Albanians went to save Jewish lives. There was a story of a shop owner in a little town called Puka, his name was Ali Alia. And in 43, a German transport, so now we're, you know, the Nazis are in Albania. There was a German transport carrying 19 Albanian uh, prisoners on their way to hard labor. And one was a Jew and he was going to be shot. He was already, you know, uh, identified for, for death. And they stopped outside Aliyah's store and sizing up the situation, and this was, you know, again, the German transport wants to stop and get something to drink and eat and they just want to take it. And 
Aliyah spoke actually excellent German. I don't know how that happened to be, but he invited the Nazis into the store, offered them food, and then purposely plied them with wine until they were drunk. So while they were drinking, um, Aliyah uh, convinced the Nazis that they should give uh, uh, food to the prisoners. And he handed the one young Jewish prisoner a piece of melon. And in it, he had concealed a note and it told him to flee into the woods and to wait for him in a designated place. When the Nazis got ready to leave Aliyah's store, they discovered the Jewish pr prisoner was missing and they were furious. They dragged Aliyah Leone to the village square. They pinned him against a wall. Four times they put a gun to his head, threatening to shoot. He refused to say a thing. He maintained his innocence. Then they left to search for the prisoner. When they returned at the end, they threatened to burn the entire village down if he didn't confess. He didn't confess. And finally, miraculously, they didn't burn the village down. The Germans left Putin for good. Aliyah went, retrieved the prisoner, and today, um, and hit him, oh, hit him in his home for two years until the war was over. And today, he's a dentist living in Mexico. And we met him in Jerusalem. You know, and, and another thing, I mean, there are so many stories, but Muslims and Christian Albanians not only risk their lives to save Jews, but under no circumstances at any time, and this is often asked, did they, were they, you know, seeking compensation or any reward? Um, after the war, Abraham Eliasov, who was known as Abraham Ghani when he was being hit, went to Betcher Chosha, who had sheltered him, and Betcher Chosha is alive, he's 93. Uh, living in Albania, and he wanted to, to give him something, give him money, and he said, no, Albanians give Bessa to a friend. We never sell them. Um, extraordinary. So, to go back to the sort of historical point, early on, Albanians were hiding uh, Jews and protecting them on their own initiative in an uncoordinated way. It was simply the response to Bessa and the tradition. But then it became more dangerous when the Germans arrived, of course. And, and I, I didn't say this, I should have before. At a number of points, the Italians and then later the Germans tried to get the Albanian government. So this is what I mean, we're talking about the top levels, and they could have easily um, you know, corrupted people. Uh, they could have done all sorts of things. They tried to convince them to turn over the list of everyone, and they refused to do it. In fact, the Albanians kind of made a deal with the Italians initially, you can come here, but you won't be doing that. Um, so when, once the Germans are in, the pressure is on, and um, so they started to become more organized, and they set up what were called National Liberation Councils in towns and villages where Jews were hiding, and then they set up a, a system to move them from place to place, either with false passports or disguised as Albanian peasants. The um, officials passed nominally some anti-Jewish regulations just to keep the Nazis, you know, at bay. Um, but it was just to placate them. They never enforced a single one. Then when the Germans asked Albanian leaders to provide the list, they refused openly, and that's been documented and that's been written about. Um, and then as the late uh, philanthropist, Jewish philanthropist Harvey Sarner, whose book we're going to give you, Rescue in Albania, showed it to you earlier, he said, the importance of Albania as a sanctuary is demonstrated by the fact that only 10% of the 70,000 Jews who were in the surrounding area of Yugoslavia really hadn't become Yugoslavia yet. That happens after the war survived the Holocaust. But I, I want to add, um, I want to insert something, though, into this part of the story because this is now evolving. Um, that would have included Kosovo. The truth of the matter is, any Jews who made it into Albania made it to made it to Albania through the help of Albanians in Kosovo, Macedonia, and Montenegro. Uh, again, uh, we didn't even I think have the name Macedonia then, but all the outlying areas. And um, in the spring of last year, uh, Mustafa Rezniki in his 80s was finally recognized by Yad Vashem. He was um, uh, a child at the time, but for his family saving role, they saved 400 um, Jews. Um, they were in Kosovo, they were in um, sort of the countryside area, but his father was a trader and had been 
working with Jewish colleagues in different parts of Western Europe, um, Thessalonica in Greece, and a whole history. So Jews had started to escape into um, his uh, village of Jacoba and Dachan in the 1930s. He already had Jews living on his property for a number of years. And then ultimately, of course, when uh, the Germans were really, the Nazis were moving in earnest um, and searching, then he, he, he was able to develop the network based on his traders' network to get them out of Macedonia, Kosovo, and, and into Albania. Unfortunately, uh, Mustafa died two months after the award was given. Um, his son, his grandson carries on what's called the Kosovo Israeli Friendship Society. There are two associations, one in Kosovo and one in Albania. After Albanians fell under communism for 50 years, they were cut off from everyone they rescued and from the rest of the world. But they started these organizations to carry on that history. And some are connecting now. I've been working with that family and with the grandson. And because I knew he was ill, I set up an oral history project and filmed about six and a half hours of tape with him that we will eventually turn into you know, a sort of short film and I'll produce um, a, an, an article so that we can begin to show that component. And this is very important at a time when um, many other people uh, won't go into all the details of trying to miscast um, what actually happened um, in the Albanian world. Uh, it connected to that in the 50 years from World War II to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Berlin Wall. Of course, most of the world didn't know the story. Um, I didn't know the story, I'm sure you didn't know the story about the unique role that Albanians played because the entire history, culture, and reality of Albanians was concealed by their oppressors. In Albania, as Joe said before, we had this horrible communist dictator, Emperor Hoxha, and then we had Tito, you know, in the rest of the of what became um, and was by then the former Yugoslavia. For a brief period of time during the Kosovo War, 1998 to 1991, the international spotlight came on the Albanian world. Most people, having grown up in the United States, learned very little about Eastern European history. But for that very brief period of time, when we saw Albanians put on cattle cars and being thrust over the border and a million, you know, being um, uh, pushed out of Kosovo, um, 12,000 were murdered. Um, refugee camps, I'm sure you saw, you know, the television coverage of people and thousands of people in refugee camps for that brief period of time, there was some understanding. And that was the period, by the way, in which Joe and I started to distribute Harvey Seiner's book, started to work really closely with members of Congress, there were 34 Jewish members of Congress, and I would say they, the two of us, and Joe Biden actually led and the fight to stop us. Um, it wasn't Bill Clinton. <laughs> um, the only person that uh, really had any um, concern inside the administration was Madeleine Albright. And that ultimately um, was decisive too um, in ending the war. And um, by that time, of course, by the time we intervened there, already 350,000 people had died in Bosnia. Four million had been displaced throughout the Balkans. And there were only 12 thousand reported dead in Kosovo, there would have been many more if NATO had not invaded. Um, since the end of the war, um, the spotlight, of course, has dimmed again. We now have Iraq and Afghanistan, major wars. We have uh, North Korea, uh, we have Iran. Um, the spotlight is no longer on the Albanian world and 125 years of a history of expulsion, arrest, torture, imprisonment, and genocide now have the, are in danger of going back into the uh, back order of history once more. And into this situation, tragically, we have um, Serbia and some other forces trying to miscast Albanians as a Muslim, potentially uh, terrorist fundamentalist force in the heart of Europe. And nothing could be further from the truth, and I hope I've illustrated that in telling the story about what happened in the Holocaust and um, what goes on to this day. I mean, 
there are literally Albanians uh, in Albania still holding on to things like a sewing machine and other, other goods left behind by the families that they say waiting for them to come back. So as a corrective to the misrepresentation of Albanians, um, Joe and I felt that it was very important to tell this story. The story is important in its own right because it's a central part of the Holocaust and um, we need to know about it. But um, we, we also can't forget that Milosevic was allowed to wield state-sponsored terrorism against non-Serbs and that, once again, the United States and Western Europe were complicit in that process. It went on for 10 years, and we know very much that our country was complicit during the Holocaust. And, and that has to be recognized as well. Um, we haven't learned the lessons of the Holocaust in short. So uh, it's a vital, I, what I try to say um, to our government is vital um, importance that, in fact, we don't have a fundamentalist terrorist Muslim force in the heart of Europe. We have an incredible group of people, four religions living side by side in harmony for centuries that have much to teach us going forward. Um, we have a choice to make. Um, we can have a world based on Milosevic's nightmarish vision of racial purity and ethnically cleansed many states throughout Europe reminiscent of Hitler. Well, we can have a multicultural, multi-religious world um, that Albanians represent. I think that with that. Thank you. Do you know anything about Bulgaria, which had a similar history? Sure. Of, uh, yes. And Jews? if you don't mind, I'll hand the books out now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Borrow that one for a minute. Uh, Shirley had to respond to that in writing. This because this is really important. Um, and this is a very hard for me, too, because um, when I wrote this article, you're going to get Jewish survival and the ethics of ESSA for Congress Monthly in 2006, I got this, I received this, and I was allowed to respond to it. Amazing letter from, that was published in my response from uh, Milford Lieberthal saying, you know, this is really wonderful, and, uh, the, you know, the article that's really close to you already did, but, you know, while this rescue of 2,000 was magnificent, what about the Bulgarians of 50,000? And, you know, I said, I don't want to have to compare heroisms or create a hierarchy of heroisms and sufferings in response to the extermination of the Jewish people during the Nazi Holocaust. Nothing can diminish, I want to read part of this, Bulgaria's savings of its 50,000 Jewish citizens while it had a pact with the Axis powers. And I won't read all of it. What they did was to be applauded, but in any case, I wrote, the assertion that Albania is the only nation that can claim that every Jew within its borders was rescued from the Holocaust is based on the fact that, you know, no one was handed over. No one. But, um, and that the, the persons saved were mostly not Albanian uh, citizens, but Jews who had fled to that country. But the records show, and you can read the whole thing, I don't want to spend too much time, the records show that Bulgaria did not receive the distinction of saving every Jew because while Bulgaria did not deport Bulgarian Jews, it deported the Nazi to the Nazi death camps, 11,000 non-Bulgarian Jews in the territory that it annexed from Macedonia and Greece, and the fact that it was Urban who had to leave, yes. who told me that the number is actually higher, that I have the number for Macedonia, but he said when you combine it all, it was 50,000 from Trace. And in addition, Jews inside Bulgaria were discriminated against, and after 94, all Bulgarian Jewish men between the ages of 20 and 40 were rounded up and sent into forced labor. And then I go on to say that, you know, I'm not interested in some type of exceptionalism. Albanians are still a people at risk, Bulgarians are not. So it is important, obviously, to recognize, I mean, 50,000 saved is, is, is incredible but it isn't the whole picture. And it, it uh, you know, what I'm concerned about, which is not what you're doing, some people are coming to us saying, well, how dare you, how dare you say this? You know, oh, Bulgaria is the one. Um, I think there's enough room for everyone, you know, who, who helped and made a difference and risked their lives. But that is the, the actual.